that's great. Okay, perfect. So I think we are recording now. I hope that's okay with everyone. Yes, okay. I see Anne. Miss Anne is nodding her head. So and I'm going to hope that with both Steve's, it's okay as well. Um, so just to kind of dive right in, uh, my name is Dr. Susie Ismail, and I am the founding director of Cornerstone, which is a faith-based nonprofit organization that focuses on spiritual, socio-emotional wellness. Um, we work with individuals of all ages, um, of all ethnic backgrounds, all races, um, and all faiths on being able to bring a more holistic approach to therapeutic interventions by providing seminars, education, programs um, that are focused on destigmatizing holistic mental health care that incorporates all aspects of well-being. So social, emotional, relational, psychological, and also spiritual. Um, we work very closely with a lot of school districts, um, so throughout the U.S., and we provide a, a lot of training programs, um, a lot of programs for CE credits, for uh, guidance counselors, for social workers, for teachers and administrators on how to best incorporate a spiritual psychosocial approach in terms of teaching, in terms of education strategies, and in hopefully building greater emotional resilience, particularly post-COVID, um, and amidst, you know, many of the difficult mental and emotional struggles that we see among our youth today. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, since we are a small group, I think we can definitely have more of a conversation. Um, Sister Leila, is there anything that you want to add before we dive in? Nope. Perfect. So I have uh, worked with ICNA for uh, many, many years now, um, and our organization Cornerstone partners with ICNA quite frequently. Um, ICNA is the Islamic Circle of North America, and Why Islam, which Sister Layla had mentioned, is a branch of ICNA uh, that focuses on providing education and resources uh, on the topic of Islam and topics related to uh, Muslim families, Muslim youth, uh, the Muslim community uh, at large. So because we've worked with ICNA uh, for many years, uh, when the uh, one of the organizers from ICNA had reached out asking me to present this program, um, I was happy to do so. Um, I don't know if any of you attended some of our programs last year on virtual education, on uh, spiritual, socio-emotional wellness post-COVID, um, on what it means to be a Muslim. And uh, we also did a teaching across faiths just on generally understanding your Muslim students. So today I'm happy that, you know, the topic we're diving into is a little bit more specific, which is how do you connect with your Muslim students during the month of Ramadan? Um, and I am sure many of you are aware that uh, currently we are in the month of Ramadan, which is the holiest of all of the months in the Islamic faith. Um, and it's a month in which many of your Muslim students may also be engaging in, uh, you know, different acts of worship that may impact how they are in the classroom. Um, and that, you know, I, I think when we learn about others, when we learn about different faiths, when we learn about our students. And I forgot to mention that I was a teacher, actually an English teacher, a uh, high school English teacher for over a decade. Um, and I also uh, teach at the university level and also served as a guidance counselor for several years in high school. So the better we know our students, the more we can connect with them, um, and the better we understand the diversity that exists among our students, um, the better equipped we are, I think, as educators, as administrators, as counselors, um, in our schools. So the first question I think that we want to tackle is what is Ramadan? And again, you know, with the media coverage that the uh, faith of Islam often gets, that the Muslim community often gets, we can sometimes get different uh, uh, versions maybe of how Islam is perceived. Um, the month of Ramadan is, uh, of course, a, a very holy month in the Islamic faith. It's a month in which Muslims believe the Quran was revealed. The Quran is the holy scripture by which Muslims uh, adhere to and which, where Muslims follow the uh, what, what is believed to be the words of God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And in the month of Ramadan, which is, again, believed to be the month of revelation in which the Quran was first revealed, um, there is a closer connection with God that Muslims are encouraged to foster. And this closer connection to God is fostered in, in one very important way, which is through fasting. And we're going to talk a little bit about fasting and how that may impact our, our children and our students as well in a bit. But first, 
trying to better understand the significance of the Qur'an, particularly in the month of Ramadan. So for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Islamic faith, the Qur'an is a, uh, uh, a book which is considered to be the word of God that has 114 chapters in it, and it is only recited in prayer in the Arabic language. Translations of the Quran can be read in native languages, so it's very common, for example, um, for uh, children or youth or adults even who don't speak Arabic to recite the Arabic verses and the chapters in their prayer, um, but to also read the translation of those verses in their native tongue, whether it's English or Spanish or German or French or any other language. Um, within the prayer, prayer itself is a, a huge component of the Islamic faith, one of the five pillars. Um, the five pillars of the faith being the bearing witness that there is only one God and that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the last messenger of God. Um, the second pillar of Islam is prayer. And prayer is the uh, a requirement uh, five times a day in which during these uh, ritualistic you know, prostration and uh, recitations, the Quran is a, incorporated in that prayer as a way to connect with God by reciting the word of God. The third pillar of Islam is fasting, and fasting during the month of Ramadan is what we're going to talk about today and looking at how that can impact some of our students and how it might impact us in the classroom as well. The fourth uh, pillar of Islam is zakat, which is charity. And this is something that's also increased quite heavily during the month of Ramadan. And it's not just charity in terms of giving from your own wealth, even though that's a big part of it, but it's also charity in the form of kindness and good deeds and positive acts. It's believed in Islam that even the smile is a form of charity when you smile in the face of your neighbor. So that, that increase of charity and charitable deeds is something that also occurs in the month of Ramadan because it is considered to be such a significant holy month. And the final pillar of Islam is the Hajj, which is the ritualistic pilgrimage that is completed once a year, um, once in a lifetime, I'm sorry, once in a lifetime for those who are able to complete it by going to Mecca and you know completing a ritualistic circumambulation, circumambulation uh, around the Kaaba um, and visiting other holy sites while there. So these are the five pillars of Islam and most likely what you will see from your students regardless of the age that they are is particularly during the month of Ramadan maybe an emphasis on prayer um, and then definitely the fasting because the fasting is something that is very communal that is done even in households where maybe from a conservative religious perspective, the family might identify as, you know, not as conservative, you will find that during the month of Ramadan, um, almost all Muslim families will adhere to the fast um, and, and will connect to God through the fast. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about why some, some of your students may not be fasting and how to navigate through that as well. So first, let's better understand what is fasting, right? So Fasting in the Islamic faith, you know, I know now if you Google any diet online, you'll look at intermittent fasting and you have six hour fast and eight hours fast. But the fasting from a Muslim perspective in the Islamic faith is a fasting from the uh, the string of dawn, which means it's before the sunrise. Right. So it's from dawn until dusk, until the setting of the sun. And that fast is a fasting and abstinence from, you know, any food, any drink. And yes, one of the questions that we'll often get is even water. And yes, the answer is even water. So it is a complete fasting of ingesting any type of food item, any drink item. Um, but that's not the only thing that you're abstaining from. You know, it is also a month in which you really want to strive to uh, negate the elements of the basis self, which is negating the basis self by holding off gratification, right? By not giving in to immediate desires. And so not only are you withholding or abstaining from any food or drink during those hours, but you're also very consciously abstaining from, you know, saying anything with your tongue that might harm someone, from lying, from backbiting, from, you know, doing actions that are, are, are things that are not 
considered pleasing to God. Um, so there's an elevated consciousness that comes along with the emptiness of the stomach and the parchment in the mouth, you know, from thirst that uh, elevates the consciousness to remind one that I am withholding from my basis needs, my basis desires. And as I am withholding from my basis desires, I can also elevate my soul, elevate my intentions and ensure that I am trying to cultivate the best version of myself. And it's not just food or drink, but also any form of sexual intimacy is prohibited during those hours of fasting. But of course, once the uh, dusk sets in, once you break that fast at dusk, then you are able to eat, you're able to resume, you're able to drink, you're able to resume your activities, but you are also encouraged to incorporate prayer. There are long prayers that go into the evening that we will talk a little bit more about as well. And so you're encouraged to keep that, that sense of what you have gained from fasting during the day into the night as well. And the goal is that it's not just the Ramadan activity, but that you're also maintaining and holding on to the lessons learned through the month of Ramadan long after Ramadan has passed, so throughout the year. So what fasting promotes is, again, the consciousness of the self and God consciousness, which in Islam is known as taqwa, which is a connection with God that takes you from the limitations of maybe the human form to a, a higher level of enlightenment in terms of knowing how when you withhold from base desires, you can, you know, really pay attention and, and focus on other elements of getting closer to God. This year, the month of Ramadan began uh, May, uh, March 21st, so towards or March 22nd, it was right around there, and it will end on April 21st. So uh, the month of Ramadan is between 29 and 30 days. It's based on a lunar calendar, so every year it moves back 11 days. Most of the mosques and the communities here in North America now um, do not necessarily follow the moon sighting. Years ago when I was growing up, you know, nobody never ever really knew like what day Ramadan was going to begin because there would be a waiting for the sighting of the moon. Now things are calculated more mathematically. Um, so in certain countries in Saudi Arabia and other countries, there will be a sighting of the moon. Many of the communities here in the U.S. will follow um, ISNA, which is the Islamic Society. Society of North America sets kind of a calculated uh, um, date for the start of Ramadan. So as I said, this year it started, you know, in March 21st, March 22nd. Uh, next year, it'll move back 11 days from that date. And it does last between 29 to 30 days. The fasting itself um, this month, so uh, for today, the withholding of food or the imsek, which means when you stop eating, um, that is at five this morning, I think it was at 521 in my area. And then the breaking of the fast that night is around 726 or so. Um, and again, most uh, of your Muslim students, you know, who are fasting will probably have the app that calculates the timing for them. So they know exactly when it's time to stop eating, exactly when to start eating. Um, and usually for that, first meal, the one that is had, you know, early in the morning, uh, before 521, um, there will be a waking up early for it, waking up at, you know, 430, 445, um, five o'clock, if you're a really fast eater, uh, ending by 521. And it, the timing changes, of course, as our days get longer, each day, um, there's a minute or two usually removed from when we can, when we're supposed to stop eating, and then uh, a minute or two added for when we actually break the fast in the evening. So that's essentially kind of the timing of, of the fast. Now, who is required to fast? So from an Islamic perspective, uh, the child who has not reached puberty is not required to fast. So the one who has reached the state of puberty um, is required to fast. The one who is ill, the one who is traveling is not required to fast. You will find though many children as young as you know seven, eight, nine years old wanting to fast and trying to fast. I know my own children, you know, at age five and six, they wanted to fast like half days. And it was something that was very important to them because of the communal aspect of fasting. There's a lot of joy when the family comes together and it might be the only time of year when you know all the family members are gonna be at the table at, you know, 726, ready to break their fast together or early in the morning, you know, you know, sleepy and, and rolling out of bed, but, you know, before 521, sitting together and eating. 
learning. So there's a beautiful communal element to Ramadan. And so you'll see children that are very young that from an Islamic perspective, it's not required for them to fast. They may be trying to fast. They might be fasting half days. Um, I know my son, for example, when he was like in kindergarten, he really wanted to fast, but he said, the only thing that I'm going to let myself eat is M&Ms. And so he would fast, you know, all day, but he would like eat a couple of M&Ms. So you might have children at different stages, you know, trying to fast, fasting half days. Um, but, you know, once the child reaches the age of puberty, then from an Islamic perspective, the fast would be something that, that's mandated um, if they are practicing. So within your classroom, though, you might find some students fasting, some students not, particularly if you're teaching in the high school level, um, where you would assume that most of the students have probably reached the age of puberty, um, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, but you may see that, for example, some of the females in your class are not fasting. Um, and this is another uh, uh, permissibility in terms of fasting. The, the woman or the female who is on her menses does not fast during the period of the menses. Um, this can be sometimes awkward for young females in particular because, you know, they're technically not fasting. You know, the body needs replenishment, needs uh, water, needs during that period of time, of course. And yet they may also hesitate to eat in front of someone or to drink in front of someone. So as educators, of course, we want to make sure that we allow kind of that level of comfort or someone may be ill you know for example my son has an autoimmune disorder that um, causes difficulty sometimes for him to fast and sometimes he will not be able to fast but it's almost uh you know awkward or, or embarrassing for him to uh, break his fast or to not or to eat in front of someone who would assume that he is fasting so providing avenues within the school maybe letting you know the muslim students know that the guidance counselor's office is always open to them and that you know if they need to take a break during the day in Ramadan. And this might help facilitate even for the Muslim students who are not able to fast due to illness or due to being on their menses during that week or other reasons that they may have. Um, you know, those who have mental health struggles who are taking medication that is needed in order for them to be okay, they may not be fasting. Those who have eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, that it may be triggered by the fast, um, for them, that may not uh, be something that they're doing. Uh, Sister Leila, did you have a question? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say also like the flip side of that, right? It's also like students who who are fasting and maybe, you know, when it's time for lunch or something, they kind of feel uncomfortable. Um, and so I know my daughter who's nine years old, she's excited to fast, right? And so she's, you know, she um, told me, you know, mom, I go to the, the counselor's office and I sit there, you know, so maybe providing them um, as you mentioned, you know, a place where they can go if it's lunchtime and they don't feel comfortable, maybe sitting with other uh, uh, students or kids who are, who are eating um, and just providing uh, them that space. Yes. Yep, absolutely. I've got that on the next slide and we we're going to talk about some ways that you can facilitate that as well. So the fasting is definitely one part of, of Ramadan, but the other aspects of what your students may be engaging in in Ramadan is increased prayers. Um, I mentioned that in the evenings after breaking the fast, um, many families will, you know, uh, rush to the, the masjid, the mosque, uh, to pray and engage in prayers that are, are relatively long. So mm -hmm. the prayers start with the nighttime prayers. So right now it's around between 9 and 9.15. At least this is in the East Coast times, by the way, you know, depending on your state, of course, the timings are different for sunrise and sunset and everything. Um, so they'll go to the prayers and oftentimes the prayers don't end until 11, 1130. Um, in some of the mosques, they go until midnight. Um, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, you will see that students are tend to be staying up later um, in, you know, acts of worship uh, in the mosque, in community centers. And this may also impact their sleep schedules, of course, because they are waking up maybe at 445 at 5 a.m. to eat something. They're fasting then the rest of the day until, you know, 730 or so they break their fast then they're going to, to prayers and they may not come home until, you know, after midnight. And, you know, the importance of this month will often, you know, encourage parents and children alike to engage in these activities, even though it is a school night. So this is where we come to the elements of accommodations, right? So 
first of all, recognizing that the disruptions in the sleep schedule, the changes in terms of eating, um, the lack of energy that can come sometimes with the not eating, that's all going to impact a child's performance, of course, you know, or a student's performance. Um, so being able maybe to allow uh, passes where for physical education class, you know, if they uh, don't have the energy to run the mile, you know, or to do the push-ups or the pull-ups, um, to recognize that that may be a concern and just giving a little bit of space uh, for children to have that uh, ability to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not feeling well, or I'm not able to uh, engage in gym, you know, during the month of Ramadan because of the thirst, because of the hunger. Um, accommodations during lunchtime is what Sister Layla was speaking about. Um, I remember, you know, when I was uh, in school, there weren't, weren't quite as many, this was a very long time ago, but there weren't quite as many Muslims, you know, or there wasn't as much awareness of the Muslim faith. And so for me, you know, it felt almost embarrassing to talk about fasting or, or you know, not eating. So I would go to the lunchroom because the school didn't provide any accommodations or anything. Um, and I would sit and, you know, my friends would be like, why aren't you eating? And I would just be like well I'm not hungry or you know I pretend to like pick at something and you know I'm happy now like with my children's generation and hopefully their children's generation there's a lot more awareness and so there's more of a willingness and an openness to maybe talk about what it is that that uh, fasting entails but also being able to provide accommodations for prayer. You know, I mentioned that prayer occurs five times a day. So usually our children, when they're in school, there will be at least one or two prayers, um, the Dhuhr prayer time, which is the noon prayer time, or the Asr prayer time, which is the afternoon prayer time, that will uh, correlate with school times. So maybe being able to provide accommodations, maybe in the library, um, a prayer corner, if there isn't a prayer room, um, maybe if there's an empty classroom. Again, I found that the guidance office tends to be um, quite the safe haven where students who have those needs and as I mentioned in the month of Ramadan um, prayer is definitely emphasized so you know you might have students who never asked for a prayer room before you know request a prayer room during that time Again, knowing that the changes in sleep, you know, especially for teenagers who seem to love sleep <laughs> at that age, um, it can impact them, um, their uh, ability to keep up with assignments. And of course, you never want, you know, a child to use Ramadan as an excuse of like, well, you know, uh, the dog ate my homework type of thing, but like it's Ramadan, that's why I didn't do my homework. Um, but being able to work with students in a way that allows for some flexibility, but also recognizing that Ramadan is not a month in which we are meant to stop everything, right? We are meant to continue to strive in the activities that we uh, normally do and to continue to seek ihsan, which is excellence in those activities, but to also recognize the limitations uh, of our own capabilities, particularly when it comes to the human body. I mentioned here, you know, pizza parties and, and other problems. Um, so you definitely don't want to not have pizza parties because I remember those were always the best parts of the school day, you know, or when somebody would bring in cupcakes or things like that. And again, I'm a child of the 80s. So I know things have changed now where, you know, there's no peanut butter and no almonds and no, there's a lot of uh, dietary restrictions that maybe growing up we didn't see as much of. So I do think as a whole, there's probably less of the food in classrooms happening, um, but still, you know, if you're doing something special in the classroom, if there is going to be food, you know, being cognizant that, you know, the child, the Muslim child who's in there, the Muslim student might want to take some to go, you know, being able to have some foil so they could wrap up, you know, a slice so they can eat it at iftar time, um, you know, letting the child, if they feel uncomfortable being around the food because it's, you know, uh, making it more difficult for them, letting them maybe step outside or, um, you know, uh, send them on an errand to the office or something, but finding ways to to work with the children um, who may be fasting. You might also see that around the 27th night, uh, 27th according to the lunar calendar, so not the 27th on the Gregorian calendar, but the 27th night is considered the night of power. Um, and it's the night, so three nights before the end of Ramadan or two nights before the end of Ramadan, it's considered a night in which that that the angels descend to earth and that the uh, prayers are, are answered. And 
we're told that as Muslims that it could be any of the odd nights within the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So you'll see an increase in prayers and increase in going to the mosque often during those last 10 nights, but particularly on the 27th night, which is also the night in which a completion of the Quran, a completion of the reading of the 114 chapters of the Quran, which are read you know, in, in pieces, in juz, which is uh, uh, smaller pieces each night of Ramadan, the completion often occurs on the 27th night. So it can be a, a long night. Um, and when I say 27th, so technically it would be the night of the 26th day of Ramadan. That would be the 27th. So you might see around the end of Ramadan where students might be absent. They might um, have a little bit more difficulty encouraging communication, encouraging students to speak up, you know, um, letting them know maybe at the start of the month, like, you know, I know this is the month of Ramadan and some of you may be fasting. Some of you may be engaging in prayer, you know, come speak to me if there's anything that I can help with. And I feel, you know, that's something in terms of inclusivity. Uh, I know there's an overlap with Passover and Easter this year. So, you know, the three uh, major monotheistic religions all have holidays around this time. So being able to not single out students. So maybe starting off by saying, you know, this month, we not only have the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, but we also have the Christian holiday of Easter. We have the Jewish holiday of Passover. Passover. And with each of these holidays and in your faith traditions, there may be specific practices that you have that you might want to make me aware of. You know, I want you to feel comfortable telling me about, you know, certain traditions or faith practices that you'd like me to be aware of. So being able to open up the communication and gently guide students, but not in a way that makes them uncomfortable. Because again, that some students may want to fly under the radar. Middle school me, high school me, you know, I didn't want anyone to ask me questions about my faith. So I'd rather sit in the ca cafeteria and just say I'm not hungry. Whereas some students, you know, again, high school me, like towards the later years was much more vocal. And, you know, I wanted to talk about my faith, but recognizing that children are going to be at different stages, students are going to be at different stages, and we don't want to push them outside of their comfort zone, but we want to show them that welcoming stance where if they would like to speak about their faith and their practice, that you would encourage it. And that would go, of course, for children of all faith traditions and faith backgrounds. And sometimes it does help to, you know, if for the younger students to, there are so many books out there now, uh, again, very different from when I was growing up. Um, but I know recently there was a uh, Curious George book, uh, Curious George Learns About Ramadan, for example. Um, there's several books like Nadia's Hands. There's uh, uh, lots of reading out there. Um, that can be helpful. Maybe just putting a few of those books in the classroom library, for instance. Um, if you are teaching younger students and you have a story time, incorporating these books, you know, and, and including, again, books about other faith traditions as well, I think that's a beautiful way to encourage the engagement. Um, and again, opening the door, you know, letting students know if you want to share some crafts or some foods or some stories that you're welcome to do so. Now we come towards the end of the month of Ramadan, which is marked by a holiday that is known as Eid al-Fitr. And this comes on, you know, following the last day of fasting. Um, so this year, Eid al-Fitr, I believe, will be April 21st. April 22nd, I, I, it's somewhere around there. I have to check my calendar. Um, but this normally, if the school does mark the Eid al-Fitr as a public school holiday, then children will have off. Here in New Jersey, we do have a very large Muslim community in the central Jersey, North Jersey, I mean, in the New York area. So a lot of schools do uh, give children the day off um, for Eid al-Fitr. But I know in a lot of other communities where um, there may not be as large of a Muslim population, that it may not be a day off. So recognizing that this is essentially a day that is very similar to how those of the Christian faith may uh, celebrate Christmas, for example, with family, with prayers, um, with, you know, uh, religious traditions that really make the day special. So Eid al-Fitr is a day of prayer. Um, it begins with, of course, uh, uh, having breakfast, because after the 29 or 30 days of fasting, um, you are now waking up and having breakfast at, you know, a normal time, right? And 
it's, it's a day of eating. You, you get to eat a lot of good food and practice gratitude, recognizing that you withheld, you know, food and drink from yourself. And you were able to do that as a human being that can rise above the base desires for an entire month. And now this is a day of celebration, a day in which you can be with family members, a day in which you can express gratitude for all the gifts that God has blessed you with. Um, there's also gift giving, uh, wearing new clothing, um, acts of charity are definitely increased on that day, whether it's visiting the poor, or visiting the sick, um, giving uh, zakat, giving in, in charity. Um, and students may want to bring in, you know, uh, special Eid cookies or Eid desserts to share in the classroom. Again, depending on your classroom policy, depending on allergies, um, opening up the door and inviting students to share from their faith traditions. Uh, that's it's a beautiful way to help students feel like they're able to celebrate a holiday that's important to them. Now, I included this slide here because, um, and then we'll head into our discussion in a minute, but uh, it's so important for us as educators to really be aware and understand the impact that, you know, uh, lack of knowledge or lack of education can have on our students. Because when we look at this study, and this was a study that was conducted by ISPU, which is the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Um, it was conducted in 2017, but it showed that uh, in answering the question, you know, who has bullied your child? And there was another slide about the percentage of bullying of Muslim students, which was pretty high. Um, but in the question, who has bullied your child? Uh, the total Muslim respondents of who, of, I guess, parents who have children who attend a K through 12 public school uh, said that their children experienced bullying at some point in the past year, um, primarily by another student or a group of students. But what was concerning to me on the slide was that 6% said by a teacher or another school official. And I know for all of you who are in this session, you are here because you want to learn, that you want to connect with your students in a way that is best for them, that you know you don't ever want to even inadvertently, you know, place a student in a position where you know their emotional well-being is compromised because of something that's said or done. Um, and it says a lot about who you are as an educator that you've come to this session today when there's a million other things going on, I'm sure, for everybody. But making sure that we are not part of the problem by being part of the solution and continuing to seek out avenues of education. And finally, you know, learning how to incorporate strategies mm -hmm. that build emotional resilience um, through the communication we have in our classrooms in Ramadan. And, you know, some of it is going to be by making the classroom a, a, a safe community, right, where community connections are built, you know, within their children of, of different faiths, even feeling that safety, where they can talk about who they are and what's important to them. Um, understanding the intrapersonal or self-talk. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how some students may feel like, oh, I don't want to talk about my faith. You know, I don't, I, I don't want people to make fun of me. And some students may feel like, no, I want to talk about my faith. I want to share what I do at home. And you'll see differing stages of that at different ages, of course. Um, the interpersonal, keeping an eye out on, you know, children. And we all know that as children grow and experience the world around them, sometimes they can be mean to each other. So keeping an eye on the interpersonal and dyadic communication that occurs between students, um, looking at, you know, group and family communication. So if a parent reaches out to you and says, hey, like, I'd like to bring some cookies for Ramadan, you know, keeping the channels of family communication open, um, asking families questions, you know, I know this is the month of Ramadan. And I know that, you know, so and so is, you know, your child is probably out late, you know, in prayer, um, I'm noticing a drop in, you know, a handing in homework, you know, is this something that we want to talk about, strategize and see what we can do better. Um, and that might be just the form of communication that's needed to help in building the emotional resilience of the child. Um, on an organizational level, you know, uh, if your community does have a lot of Muslim students, maybe speaking to the school board, maybe proposing the idea of having the day off or maybe a half day for Eid um, and seeing, you know, or an excused absence for children. Um, and taking a systems approach. So really looking at the change in the landscape among Muslim Americans uh, throughout the US and recognizing that um, 
you know, systematically, we are trying in so many fronts to become more inclusive in our communities and in our schools. And we want faith identity to be part of that inclusivity. So it, it doesn't help to work very hard on, you know, inclusivity when it comes to uh, sexual orientation or when it comes to gender identity, but then to leave out faith identity because of taking a secular approach. If we're going to move towards inclusivity and welcoming all of our children, we want to be aware that for many of our children, many of our students, faith identity is an important component of who they are. So I will wrap it up here. This is my personal contact information. And I know that ICNA also has contact information uh, on their Why Islam website, but I want us to get some uh, discussion going. So I will end the slideshow here. Um, and open us up in this way. Uh, and at the end, I'm sure Layla will share the ICNA, uh, the ICNA Y Islam information as well. But I want to open it up to you guys now. If you have questions, comments, examples of things that you've seen in your classrooms, maybe that you'd want to share or, or ask at all. I have a question about um, testing happens often in the spring. And I'm wondering if there's um, a legal um something in place legally that would allow students to um move that testing window or test it another time because they may not be as fresh as they would need to be yes yeah i think that's a great question and i think that goes to the systematic changes that we were talking about um you know it's because we're such a pluralistic society i feel like on almost any day of the year you're going to find um some faith that, you know celebrating a holiday maybe or something ramadan of course is considered you know the highest of holidays right throughout the month and the act of fasting does impact the ability to concentrate um as far as i know there isn't like a national like uh, uh kind of excuse. Um, I know I've had students in the past where like the MCAT fell on the day of Eid and, you know, they had already registered for it and they didn't know what to do and they um, they weren't able to get out of it. They would have lost their money if they had the SAT, the same thing. With standardized testing, I know that there is a policy in place where if somebody is absent for a day, they can uh, make it up, you know, in, in many school systems. If you are able to work with, you know, the school, with the district, you know, to see is it possible to provide make update so that the children could take them after you know the month of Ramadan is done um, because of the fasting then that would be incredibly helpful I also know uh, currently again this didn't exist in the 80s but currently there is an opt-out option where some parents can choose not to have their child test um, because at Cornerstone we deal with a lot of young people that struggle with anxiety and severe testing anxiety we have seen that their emotional wellness hinged upon being able to use that opt out option. So I think being flexible and understanding that if, you know, uh, for one year, you know, in fifth grade, uh, a child doesn't take the standardized test, I promise you, it will not negatively impact them, you know, when they're like 25. You know? So I think being able to have that flexibility and understanding, and if, you know, parents are concerned or children are concerned, letting them know what options they do have. Any other questions or concerns or things that you might see in the classroom? Leila, is there anything that you wanted to add to the session that maybe I didn't cover or that comes to your mind as a teacher? No, you know, I think you covered everything so well. <laughs> yeah, um, nothing comes to mind at the moment. Um, but definitely, you know, we, we want to hear back from from those who have joined, um, you know, maybe um, some feedback as well. You know, how did this session help them, and, you know, and, and, and maybe get a better understanding um, um, of, you know, what their students are going through. So if we can get some feedback, that'd be great as well. So yeah. would you want them to email uh, the Y Islam office or email Cornerstone or what would be the best way if there is? Yeah, so, right. So why Islam? So why Islam org. So actually, we uh, provide resource, resources as well. So I'm going to share the information, the website um, um, and chat. And also, um, you can contact us on the hotline 877 Y Islam if you have any questions about Islam um, on, on any topic about Islam, then you can contact the hotline. So I'll share that information in chat. 
Perfect. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Leila, with the hotline, because one of the other things that we tend to see in schools is that sometimes, you know, friends of Muslim students who are not Muslim themselves will fast in solidarity, you know, or will want to join the fast. Um, and a lot of times they they have questions, you know. Um, so this whyislam.org website is a wonderful resource, um, even for, you know, students who may be questioning or curious or want to learn more. Can, I'm taking notes as I, as we're going through this presentation. I'm wondering if you can give that hotline again. Yeah, so it's in the chat box now, but it's 877-Y-ISLAM. So W-H-Y-I-S-L-A-M, that's the hotline. And the okay. website is whyislam.org. So W-H-Y-I-S-L-A-M.org. And it's Thank a good resource. Just so many articles on there, so many little video clips. Um, so lots of good information there. Thank you. And I'll put our website there as well. Um, so for Cornerstone, we are, as I said, an organization that provides uh, alternative therapeutic interventions, um, particularly for communities uh, and, and faiths and, you know, backgrounds that have traditionally stigmatized mental health care. Um, if you have students who are struggling um, from a, uh, you know, psychosocial, emotional standpoint, you can always refer them to our website as well. And that's just cornercounseling.com. Yeah, no, that that's really great. That's amazing, you know, because um, you know, I know I know that the students, you know, really go through a lot. Um, actually, you know, um, just being, you know, um, in in public schools, you know, they're not, you know, it's not um an Islamic school, so they're they're in public schools and they're um, you know, fasting, and so they may be moody. <laughs> you know, we we ourselves we get moody, you know, sometimes, you know, um, and so they may, you know, be be facing a lot of, you know, some challenges with that, you know, dealing with the, you know, teacher and and tests and homework and and trying to focus, you know. So, um, yeah. So so those resources are really great. Yes, absolutely. So I am actually going to stop the recording now because I realized I forgot to do that. So let me stop the recording. Um,